Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us at Valley Community Church and our online service. It's so good to have you. Look, we're doing a series right now, and it's called Money Talks. And we've already covered a couple of weeks, and we're going to jump into week three here today. And again, we're doing the deep dive. We're talking about money and how money, sometimes, of course, when we talk about money, people have many different ideas about money, and, and it can trip us up when we begin to think about just how we use it and what does God think about money and, and all of it. Last week and the week before, we talked about greed. We talked about how it can get in our head, and that's what gets us out of sync with God. And so what we have already dis- established is that when we fully submit and surrender to God, then we can think rightly about money. Did you know that God has a lot to say about money? He absolutely does. And today we're going to go a little further into that. So today in week three, we're going to talk about Jesus and money. And I'm subtitling it, Jesus Overturns the Tables. Now, you know what we're talking about. And of course, this is a double entendre. I'm talking about him physically doing it. But he also overturned the tables when we talk about money as a whole and the reality of how we as Christians look at money how we live our lives. And so what I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks is establish the reality of what it is that Jesus said about money and what Paul said about money and essentially our New Testament view as we've interpreted the Old Testament into the New. So let's jump right in. I want you to imagine just for a minute with me. As Jesus, here he is, he's beginning to teach. He's, he's launched into his ministry. But let's, let's think about how Jesus was, you know, came to fruition. How he, at the age of 30, became a rabbi. And what does that mean? Well, he was a teacher. And he well understood the word of God. Even at the age of 12 years old, he was already instructing and explaining to priests who'd been studying the Old Testament all of their lives. And yet Jesus had an incredible understanding of the Word of God. Why? Because he was the Word of God, right? That's what John tells us. And so he was the full revelation of the Word of God and what God was doing. And so obviously as a human, all God, all man, he understood the Word of God in its entirety and how to communicate it. Of course, then his God, the Gospels and, and his teachings are going to have an incredible amount of weight. So here he is, he's walking into the temple in the outer courts and he sees them buying and selling. They call them the money changers as people are you know, breaking a 20 and allowing them to, to be able to buy uh, pigeons and goats and, and their sacrifices for this, 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 the, the, of course, the Sabbath and the Day of Atonement and all the different things that were coming up. And of course, Jesus is in the Passover feast. Jesus is overwhelmed because he sees the Lord's court that was supposed to be used for a place of holiness and preparation for being in the presence of God all turned into a market. And so the passion of the Father and God inside him and who he is just rises up and begins overturning the tables. Now, he did that again as a passionate anger to just, and he, and he rebuked him and said, this place was supposed, this is my father's house and you've turned it into a den of thieves. In other words, they were making profit out there. They were doing all kinds of things to just really discredit what the temple system was all about. And of course, we know the temple represents Jesus and his work, so it must have been a very powerful moment. So Jesus overturns the tables of the money changes, but he also begins to overturn our thoughts on money. So let's jump into that. One of the things that we understand about the whole mission of Jesus and that we have already communicated a a little bit is that Jesus there in the Sermon on the Mount and all of his teachings, what he's there to correct, what he's overturning when we think of the tables is this very simple truth that it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. And that, that's why Jesus goes through and he takes the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the, on the Mount and basically says, look, you've turned God's law into just a bunch of rules and obligations. Without its heart, without its center, without its motive, then the law just becomes a, an empty, obligatory service. And that is what Jesus is exposing. And that is the fruit of what is taking place there in the outer court in in, in there at the temple. And so Jesus is basically coming to say, look, this is no longer a sacrifice to you. Because remember, we've talked about sacrifice and how important that is to God. And that how the tithe was all established, was all laid in the foundation of sacrifice. And it costing us something. And Jesus is saying, look, this isn't costing you anything. It's no longer based on the fear of the Lord. It's no longer based on anything. You're you're not walking in 
with uprightly with the understanding of money being surrendered fully to God, that God has given you this and that you're surrendering in a free will offering or with a tithe or whatever it is or how you're even spending your money in a way that is honoring to God. In other words, you know, what we use our money to buy is something that God is watching too. And so we're talking about all this. So Jesus gives us the foundation. It's all about the heart. So Jesus is teaching the, the disciples. He's, he's revealing to this to them. He talks about it's almost difficult, it's almost impossible to go to heaven, of course, and being a rich man. And then Jesus says, but all things are possible with God if you go back to, essentially to the foundation of what money is all about. And then Jesus has these wonderful uh, uh, living experiences. And one is where he takes him to the temple and he shows the people bringing in their offerings. And you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees all coming in, they're giving their offerings in pomp and circumstance and they're wanting everybody to see that they're now giving an offering. And yet here comes this widow and Jesus says, look, watch, here comes this widow who's very, very poor and she puts in a mite. And, and, and I don't know if you've ever seen a mite, but it's the smallest little coin you've ever seen in your life. It's just, it's kind of a, it's, it's a third of a penny in size, a third of a penny. And, 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 and he drops that, she drops that mite in there. And Jesus said, do you, you see what just took place there? That woman right there, and you can find the story in Mark chapter 12. And he said, do you see what's taking place here? He said, these, these Pharisees and Sadducees, they've come in and only given a fraction of their wealth. And yet they do it in all pomp, pomp and circumstance. But this woman has come in and given all she had. She gave all she had. And so we talk about tithe, we talk about 10%, we talk about percentages, we talk all about, and Jesus is saying, look, 10% as, 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 in, in, in a sense is really just the beginning for the believer. You know, God set a 10% because he knew their hearts, that God was going to have to bring them to that point. But Jesus was pointing out to say, look, if you're going to be a living sacrifice, if you're going to be a believer and follow me, then you've got to be willing to give it all whenever that, that, that comes to that, that that's your heart. And so she did. And Jesus said, do you see what she just did there? He said, she will be blessed in a greater measure because it, what God was measuring at that moment was, was not what was being given, but the proportion and the heart. He said, this woman was giving out. It took great sacrifice. It took great faith to do what she was doing. That's amazing, isn't it? Jesus, in his very powerful teaching fashion, exposes that. And it's giving them a very creative, experiential uh, uh, value uh, uh, experience for them to see. So... He goes on also and says, look, do not be, as in the whole teaching, as he's, he says, do not be like the hypocrites. And he uses that word hypocrisy as it concerns money and giving and sacrifice. And see, the, 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 the Israelites up to that time, into, right at the time of Jesus, they're in the pinnacle of their hypocrisy. They have long forgotten why they were doing what they were doing. Their experience, their religious experience had just broken down de-evolved into this, this very broken uh, relationship, stripped religion, obligatory religion. And so Jesus is, is exposing that. Now, can we as Christians fall into that, that same mode? Absolutely. I've seen it. You've seen it. Where Christians can just go through the motions and just, just kind of take Christianity and turn it back into a, a, a dead religion that no longer has a heart, that no longer understands sacrifice, that no longer understands what it is that it's all about the heart. When we begin to rely upon tradition and ritual and liturgy, then we have forgotten what it is all about, that it's all about a person, it's all about my heart, and it's all about sacrifice, and it's all about life. We already said that in Romans chapter 12, Paul pulls it all together for us because he understands what Jesus taught. And he, once again, he says, it's all about the heart. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees and hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, and your cumin. Of course, spices that would have had tremendous value. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Character, of course, which reveals the heart, the fruit of the heart that pours out into a desire for justice rather than bitterness and revenge. Mercy rather than withholding or judgment. 
and then faithfulness rather than just only giving a portion of our life. You know, here, Jesus, here's, a, here's an hour of my life a week. Knock yourself out. You know, this, this is what Jesus is after, and this is why he's teaching. He says, look, the law was all about helping you become a better follower of the Father, and now Jesus is teaching us how to become a better follower of, of the Savior and our Father. He says, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, you should continue to tithe, but you should do it with the, the right heart. He said, you should not only do it with the right heart, but that you're, you should go beyond just being a tither. You should go on to be one who, shows, who desires justice, who is showing mercy, and is walking in faithfulness to God. Now, if we applied that to the church today and to our, how we, we live with our money, that's exactly what God, is, what God is trying to communicate to us. He says, look, your tithe is only just the beginning. Our offerings are only just the beginning. They're really a fruit of our heart for God. They're not, it's not the other way around. In other words, we don't give our money in hoping that it will change us. No, we ask the Holy Spirit to change us and our heart to give and to surrender and to use our money for justice, for mercy, and for faithfulness. Think about that for a moment. When we see that we're giving as a part of the kingdom of God and advancing it, oh boy, that's a totally different thing altogether. And again, this is what Jesus is trying to teach us. So Jesus reinforces again he's overturning the tables of this hypocrisy and he reinforces and lives the law of reciprocity so he is going to talk about he taught there in matthew chapter 7 verse 1 and 2 he says do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way you judge others you will be judged and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Jesus uses a, a, an, an example, but then he shows where that example comes from, and that is a universal truth. One might even call it a law, a universal law of what we call reciprocity. In other words, give and it shall come back to you. And he's saying, look, the measure you use, so it's not just give and, and it'll come back to you, but even the measure you use will be measured back to you. And that's a one for one. And we talk about that from time to time, that that is the basic law of heaven, the reciprocity. But when, we, when, we, when that is then filtered or energized or empowered by the kingdom of God and by a surrender through Jesus Christ, we go from just one to one to one to exponential growth. That's the cool part. And that's, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk more about that. Paul actually takes us a little further and that's for next week. But Jesus is teaching us to say, look, when it comes to everything in our life, we reap what we sow. The seeds we put on the ground will be what are grow up in our garden, but even more, they will produce greater fruit for good or for bad. You gotta think about that because that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. And then he goes on in Luke chapter six, 38, and he says this, and expanding on this reciprocity, now this is all Jesus now. He says, give and it shall come back to you one for one. And now here's where he gets the, the supercharge. This is where he takes us into the kingdom of God. For, done, for one, for those rather, who are submitted their finances to him. He says, it'll come back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Don't you love that? Now, what is he talking about there? Where does that analogy, that, well, and obviously that's, that, that is in the wine presses, that is in the figs as they press them down into fig cakes. They understood, any, any of the farmers, any of the agrarian you know, peoples that had simple lifestyles would have listened to what Jesus was saying and knew that if they had a harvest that was pressed down, shaken together, in, in other words, to have so much that they were able to mix their wines and to do the different things that they were doing in order to, to, to sell their goods, and then shaking together and running over. What does that talk about? Well, that's running over. That means having more than you ever thought you would get. That I only prepared a vat to fill so much. I only have so many wineskins. I only have so many storage booths. But yet, because God has blessed me, it's going to be pressed down. In other words, every little square inch is going to be used up. It's going to be shaken together. In other words, it's going to be so much it spills over and then running over. See, that's the heart of God. When we embrace the law of reciprocity when it comes to our money, and it's surrendered to God, and we live in such a way is that our money, our life, our life and our money, our fear of God, our money, our faith and our money, they all, they're in, they're, it's all together. 
In other words, we don't live a separate life when it comes to the, the money we have. Because folks, look, the Old Testament, which we've already covered in, a, in, a, in a, just a, a brush, a wide brush, it's established that all of this comes from God. What we learn in the Old Testament is that God is the provider. God was the one who took care of Adam and Eve in the garden. It was the God who continued to take care of them through the knowledge of all these truths that we can see in nature. This law of reciprocity is easily observed, and God says, look, I work the same way when it comes to the kingdom of God. So he talks about giving to the poor. There in Proverbs 19, 17, of course, we're, we're, we're looking at Proverbs, but I, I want you to see that the idea of giving to the poor is something that Jesus once again reinforced. And we're going to look at that uh, actually here in a bit, but I want to mention Zacchaeus as an example. Zacchaeus was a very wealthy man, and he was a small little man, the Bible tells us. He climbed up on a tree, he looked at Jesus, Jesus came, his heart was stricken with guilt, and what does it say? He, gave, he went back and gave half of what he had to the poor, and then he even paid back and was committed to continue to be, what? Faithful, to, to look for justice and for mercy. Those things, those qualities easily begin pouring out of Zacchaeus' heart. Why? Because he has an encounter with Jesus Christ. He has an encounter with truth. And goes, notice, he's a very wealthy man. And yet, he could have easily just said, well, Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins. And then go back to just keep living the life he was living. Now, is that right? Not, uh, not at all. And see, for anyone who ever con had contact with Jesus, not only would their hearts be stricken, but they would, they would, there would be action. And Zacchaeus shows that in, as a perfect example, as a response to his, the words he heard from Jesus and the life he lived. See, here's a faulty assumption that I think, when we talk about tithes and giving, there's a faulty assumption, and that is that Jesus didn't teach on tithing. And I hear this from time to time. Actually, I just quoted from the, a verse where Jesus, I know it's, 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 it's one verse, but I'll tell you what, you don't need any more for Jesus to be able to say, look, you've been, you've been tithing of your mint, dill, and cumin. He says, but you, you need to keep doing that, but you need to add to it the faithfulness, the mercy, the justice, right? That's what he was saying. So to me, he has established that. Jesus didn't need to say that five, six, seven, 12 times. He showed that. Now there's another reason why Jesus didn't teach on tithing all that much. And this is kind of a, uh, a takeaway argument, but it's absolutely true. And that is, why would Jesus have to teach tithing to people who understood tithing like breathing in and out? In other words, Jesus didn't have to tell them to tithe. They knew they were supposed to be doing it. Why? Well, that's why they were in the money changers. That's why they were doing all what they were doing. They knew that they had to have obligatory gifts to give at the temple. Look at the temple. It's well cared for. It's taking place. The priests are wealthy. Where'd they get that money? From the tithes and the offerings of the people that gave faithfully. In other words, they understood it. What Jesus was saying is you're all giving for the wrong reason. And it's because of that that many of you are suffering. It's because of that you are not prospering in your soul. It's because you're mistreating money. You're mistreating God. Now, remember last week we talked about in Malachi chapter 3. And you need to go back to that. If you haven't studied it, you need to read the whole prophet, the whole book. Malachi chapter 3, he pulls it all together. But God then speaks to him and says, you're robbing me with tithes and offerings. He says, you're ignoring me. But it's interesting. They got that message up at the time of Jesus, so they went back to tithes and offerings, but Jesus said, yeah, but you forgot the purpose. You're not, they're giving the gift, but they're not honoring God. You see, there's a huge difference. You know, you may be a tither, and I'm very, very grateful for that if you're bringing your tithe into the whole storehouse here with us, as Malachi says. But if your motive is to try to just impress or just pay just whatever to kind of pay as you go kind of a thing, and you're not thinking about giving it as a free will offering to God, giving it joyously, giving it to honor the Father because he is the giver of wealth, then, my friend, you need to change that. You need to embrace that because to whom much is given, much is required. And on top of that, Jesus teaches incredible teachings. And I'm going to get to those here in just a second. I've got to push on. So again, what he does is corrects the motive over and over again. He overturns the table. What is the table? It is the motive. 
He's upset because it, not for necessarily exactly what they're doing, but where they're doing it and why they're doing it. You see? All right. Jesus teaches against stewardship in many ways through his parables and his examples. I don't have the time this morning to go through all of those, but you can look it up. Go through especially the book of Matthew, and you will find money after money after money illustration, parables where Jesus teaches faithfulness, he teaches stewardship, and what you will find is that so many times Jesus is just almost like, wow, that's, that's heavy duty. When he says, look, there was a man, there were three men that had these talents, and you can find this, this uh, in many places in, in the synoptic gospels, but Jesus is teaching and he says, look, there was a man with one talent, a man with two talents, I'm, I'm sorry, three talents, and a man with five talents. The men with three and five talents went and invested it and they used what God had gave them, or the master, and they doubled it. But the man with one talent buried it. In other words, he wasn't willing to sacrifice or to, to even put himself in harm's way in order to be able to use his money of course, Jesus is talking about the life, but remember, anytime Jesus used a type or to the antitype, then what we find is that both are equally true. So he's talking about money here. He's talking about faithfulness with investing. He's talking about something deeper, stewardship, folks. Stewardship of our life, stewardship of our money. Stewardship does not stop at the door when it comes to just spiritual things. Uh uh-uh. Stewardship, as we find in the book of Proverbs, that will absolutely pour into every area of our life. How we work with our money, how we save our money, how we use it for the glory of God, how we prayerfully consider what we're going to use our money for. How we're going to, are we going to go into debt for something? Are we going to walk in in, in presumption? Are we going to trust God and wait upon God? See, these are all the things that God teaches us through stewardship. And Jesus reinforces this with teaching after teaching after teaching. In Matthew 18, Jesus is teaching on forgiveness. But again, he uses a money illustration as an example. Because again, money reveals the heart. Show me your checkbook or your credit card statement, and, and, and I'll be able to tell you how you live your life. And you'll be able to look at mine and do the same. We, that is, what we spend our money is an absolute illustration. How we live our lives with money is an absolute and complete illustration of where our heart is. Where your treasure is, isn't that what Jesus said? There your heart is also. Very, very key for us to remember this. Matthew 18, Jesus is speaking about the unmerciful servant. The unmerciful servant is forgiven a great debt, turns right around and demands a smaller debt from another guy. And the king comes, calls him back in and says, why did you do that? I forgave you such a great debt. Yet you turned around and tried, it. again, matter of the heart. And Jesus said, if you don't forgive others from your heart, you know, God will not forgive your sins. And he says, and you will have to pay back every dime in order to get out of the prison, the tormentors, all of that. Read Matthew 18. Jesus, once again, is using money as a background to teach a spiritual truth so that the spiritual truth and the financial truth are both equally true. And that's very powerful and absolutely masterful when we think of what Jesus does. Jesus did not demand, again, that Zacchaeus. Now, think about Zacchaeus. I'm going to finish with him or here in just a second. To think of Zacchaeus, because it's a wonderful example. You need to read about him again. And Jesus does not demand that Zacchaeus give his wealth away. You never read that. In other words, now, he may have done it secretly. He may have, when, when they had a meal with him, Jesus may have said, you know, now, Zacchaeus, now that you've repented, now that you've forgiven your sins, you know, remember what the law states. Jesus may have reminded him, but it was a free will. It was a choice that Zacchaeus made as a result of a confrontation with Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. But Zacchaeus knew that in the Old Testament, that if he had robbed from the poor, which he had done, that he, and that he had been illicit in his financial dealings, that God wanted him to go back, that according to the law, for him to be repentant, that he was going to have to pay back what he owed, and that's why he did what he did. Okay, that wasn't just a random thing. It was based upon the law. So Zacchaeus knew that his heart was wrong. Once again, his heart was wrong. And when it came to money... And so as he comes in confrontation or in in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is confronted. No one knew more quickly than Zacchaeus himself that he was walking with wrong motives and a sinful life when it came to his money. Folks, look, when it comes to our money, 
when we let God into our heart to seek him, right? Matthew 6, to seek Jesus, seek God first, to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, then he'll add all these other things to us as well. This is a flipping of the kingdom. This is a flipping of our life. And Jesus flipped it, didn't he? He turned over the table and brought truth right into the middle of how we live our lives in so many ways. But in this way right here, it applies to everything. That is our motive. What is the core of our heart when it comes to forgiveness? What is the core of our heart when it comes to marriage? How we raise our children? What is the core of our heart when we look at what's going on in the world today? Folks, that's what Jesus was always after, is that very truth right there. Jesus comes to bring clarity by speaking the truth, because he is the truth, isn't he? Restoring the ancient truths long forgotten was his mission, including the power and value of sacrifice, which he would ultimately show the world what sacrifice really was, didn't he? Jesus taught on sacrifice, but then Jesus capped it all off by giving his whole very life. Paul sees that and knows that if there is a great debt to be paid, then our paying back of that debt, once again, you're talking about value, Paul says, look, what is our response to such great salvation, Romans chapter 12, but to be a living sacrifice? Folks, sacrifice needs to be a part of our lives and and, and all that we do. In other words, sacrificing of our time, the sacrificing of our lives, our energy, our emotion, our love for one another, and our money. Our money needs to be fully surrendered to God. We need to think in terms that 100% of every dime that we are given belongs to him first. And we honor him. He's not asking for all of it. He's only asking for a portion of it so that we honor him and we ourselves always remember where it comes from. That's the point. That's the purpose. Matter of fact, tithing, when mixed with a true heart and motive to worship God, produces an amazing believer. A believer who then is cooperating, but more than cooperating, is actually in a partnership with God to change the world through the church, and through our lives being salt and light. So today, I want to finish. Let your heart be broken when it comes to these thoughts. Let God in. If your heart is hardened when it comes to the motive of money, if you have guarded it, if you have, if you have hoarded it, if you have kept it to yourself, then my friend, Jesus is after something you, in you very deeply. So he says this. Let the response To Jesus be as Paul said, I am the sacrifice, begins with my whole life and ends with that. Folks, thanks for joining me this morning. I want to pray with you right now to finish up our service. So, so very grateful for your opportunity or the time you've taken to be with us. Lord, I ask you now to bless us and keep us and make your face shine upon us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us in our understanding of how to use our finances. Lord, if we are those who have not tithed or walk in that, in that, that discipline of tithing, Lord, help us to see that, Lord, you want to bless us. But it begins with that sacrifice, Lord. It begins of understanding, though, Lord, it all belongs to you. But that, Lord, as we honor you with the first fruit of our wealth, if we honor you with our life, God, you will bless us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Lord, will you bless us? Lord, I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that right now, anyone who's listening, especially for those, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, and Lord, please give us a call. Lord, just bless anyone who's listening to us today as they're seeking you to seek your face. Lord, give them faith right now. Help them to give their lives to you, and Lord, you will listen. Lord, I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, thanks again for joining us. Again, we finish with with our appeal to you that if God puts on your heart to give and to tithe, you can do that right online with all the different electronic methods that we have as well as, as being able to give physically to bring it by or to send us your tithe and offering. We love you. We're so grateful for you. Have a great week. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on our online service. We want you to know that if you want more information about Valley Community Church, we'd love for you to visit our website. That's valleychurch.us, where you can find more information about taking your next steps. We also have an app that you can download on your phone where you can find more information about Valley Community Church. We'd love for you to come on a Sunday morning and join us all together. We have 
lots of different services. We meet on Thursday night and we meet on Sunday at multiple services. Just go to our website. You'll find more information about when we meet and what those times are. Again, thank you for joining us and God bless you. We have a great day.